the way we normally run this, uh, we have a speaker today, it's uh, Gary, over there. Um, and uh, Gary is going to talk for about, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes or so. He's uh, talking about his company that he's starting, um, and uh, I hear he's doing very well. Um, and then after that, um, I want you guys to uh, mingle and meet each other and connect and uh, you know, see how you can support each other. So, Gary Minkowski. So I'm going to be communicating telepathically with Alex. I, I studied engineering and I, I did co-op, so I had the chance to work at five different companies throughout my engineering degree. And uh, basically all I learned from working at all these different companies, from like Raytheon to uh, Scotiabank to a bunch of random engineering companies, I realized that A, I probably didn't want to work at a large, uh, large company, and B, I knew that I had to... I had to make something. I mean, I had to physically, my, what, I, what, what I was working on, I had to actually you know, physically make something. And uh, I looked at some options getting out of university, and a project that I was working on my fourth year of engineering, it was actually uh, a little computer that goes in your wallet to track spending. The hardware that I was working on was also uh, kind of transferable to the wrist. I uh, made a quick prototype and um, invented what I called uh, the Impulse smartwatch. It's a hackable smartwatch. Um, it's got an embedded processor, a Bluetooth chip, an OLED color screen, and can connect to your smartphone uh, by Bluetooth. The idea originally, you know, I come from Waterloo, which is the home of BlackBerry. Uh, you might have heard of it. It's a <laughs> smartphone that's somewhat popular outside of the valley. Um, it's fairly popular in Waterloo, and a lot of people have fun things there. Uh, I wanted to build something that would alert you to what's happening on your smartphone when you don't have your smartphone out. You know, there's a, I, I'm a big cyclist, and uh, I wanted to be able to figure out who was calling me when, uh, when I was biking, or to be able to see who was texting me, because you know, I was pretty good at texting while biking, but I still didn't want to drop my, uh, my phone on the ground. Um, it turns out, you know, I started talking about it uh, in my final year of university. Um, pitching the idea around, and people said, "Hey, you should, you know, make a go at it. See, uh, see if you can turn that into an actual product." Um, little did I know that would be uh, two years of very hard work. But uh, we um, we started selling these at the beginning of 20, uh, 2011, and uh, we've been working down here since. Uh, so building something, you got to you got to build something that a you want to use, and b uh, you think other people want to use. And I guess it always starts as what you want to use. Um, and, that's, and that's what I started with. Uh, I don't think I would wear my first prototype ever, um, but I showed it around. It, uh, it was what sort of let me take that spark in my mind and put it in other people's minds. Because people could imagine, I mean, this, you know, this was 2008, I guess the iPhone had just been out for a year. People were starting to use smartphones, and especially Blackberry, where people are sort of addicted to email. Once they, once they could see physically something, they could actually imagine what, what it would be like to have this on their wrist. And uh, I found that that was, well, it, it, it felt obvious for me that I needed to build something to show off what it was like. Team is extraordinarily important on hardware. It's even harder on hardware projects because there's so many discrete tasks that have to be done. You have to have someone who's experienced and knowledgeable in PCB design. Someone who's had experience building boards, maybe for another company, sourcing components, working with CMs, and, uh, and figuring out how to get this actually manufactured, and you need people who can, you know, code it. And so those are all like interesting, discrete tasks that, you know, would be great if, if you're a, if you are a, um, an expert in all those tasks. Sure, you can go ahead and start your own software, uh, hardware company by yourself. But if not, you have to sort of work with a variety of people. If I would have done it again definitely would have selected um, people that were interested in going all in right at the beginning. That, uh, that definitely changes the game and probably hanging out at Hacker Dojo is not the, the worst thing you could do to find those people. Um, we did file a provisional patent as early as possible. Uh, that was under recommendation from a mentor. Uh, wasn't, I mean, it wasn't as bad as you guys might think it would be. It took half a week, so uh, yeah, about 20, 20 to 30 hours of writing up a plan, um, worked with a law firm um, to actually sign off on it. They, we, got a, we got a pretty good deal, but I believe that that's roughly the going rate for a provisional patent. A provisional patent for 
for you guys, it's, uh, it's basically setting a filing date in the sand. Um, you see that today, this is the, our goal is to file a patent within one year. Um, the benefit of this is you don't have to spend a larger chunk of cash right on that date, um, but you get the benefit of being able to claim that early filing date going forward worldwide. So that's why we chose to do a provisional patent. Going backwards, we launched way before we actually shipped. Um, we launched, I, I, I made the decision to launch as in start publicly talking about the product because I wanted to build a little bit of momentum. We launched, kind of interestingly, we, uh, we leaked it first. I leaked one of, I, I took a blurry picture of like a prototype watch and leaked it to a blog called Crackberry and they ran with it, but broken telephone happened and it ended up someone at Engadget or something picked up the story as if Rim was making a Blackberry watch. So our like little blurry stupid picture went all the way around the internet for a week. And I was like, I was thinking, is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? It turned out it was a pretty good thing because um, all the stories, all the papers and everything that covered us when it was just a rumor, you know, Rim's launching a watch. They picked it up again saying, no, it's not actually Rim, it's a startup. So they, uh, they fooled us all. Um, we launched we started getting publicity, we got a pre-order list going. We never accepted payment until we could ship. And that's something that ticks me off about other start hardware startup companies. Excuse me, sorry to anyone here, but like, don't accept payment until you ship. If you're doing Kickstarter, that's a little bit different because that's, an, I mean, hopefully the communication's there that they're doing donations rather than actually buying a piece. But please don't accept payment before you ship. You know you can ship because everything takes three times as long as you think. and. It doesn't reflect too, I mean, it, we don't all, we, we interact in some way, you know, our expectations that we set have an effect on other people that, you know, um, buy hardware from startups. So I would highly recommend not accepting payment. It's tough, but I would say figure out another way. What we did is we did a bit of social engineering. We put up a shopping cart and it looked like you were about to pay, but then at the end of the checkout process, it just said, oh, by the way, this is a pre-order, you know, um, well, it, was already, it was always a pre-order, but we sort of made it look like uh, there would be a credit card thing at the end. And so we feel like our leads were much higher quality. Um, keep track of all the people that email you. I uh, had a lot of distributors email me in the early days. Um, kept in communication with them, because you never know when uh, you might have a whole bunch of things that you want to sell. Uh, the product versus a company thing is difficult. A lot of people said, that's why I wasn't able to raise money at the beginning. I think I didn't pivot the product, I pivoted the company from a single use device that talks to your Blackberry exclusively and started talking about it more as a platform on your wrist, looking at creating your own applications to run on the watch um, and interacting with you know, Android, jailbroken iPhones, uh, other devices. Um, once I was able to convey that information, people started imagining a little bit more about what could be displayed on the wrist, what are some of the interesting bits of information that you can uh, plot down there. Um, so, I, I mean, obviously I don't know what everyone's working on, but think about that. Think about how you could not change what you're building or change the product, but change how you explain your product so that it seems, a, I mean, it seems a little bit more like a full, full blown company. So in, we, we wanted to increase the, uh, decrease the time of our testing, and to do that we had to make it so it wasn't a, uh, a pressed down test fixture. What we did was massacre the USB spec by pushing a UART through the D plus and D minus lines on the USB port. Um, so we have a USB port on the side of the watch. We only use it for charging. That meant, it's actually micro USB, so it meant that there were three extra lines on the, uh, on the USB board. So decided to push a UART through there and a reset toggle line. So these USB cords, we can basically flash the watch, which means load the firmware on the watch in situ, which means they can be fully assembled and then tested, um, which means that we can test it right before it goes with the box and ship them out. Um, we have these USB cords connected to the UARTs on the Fox board, so. Uh, yeah, we, and we were careful to make sure that it doesn't like fry your computers. So you plug it into your brain. USB port for charging. Anyways, <laughs> Fox board, it's awesome. It's like 180 bucks. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. PCB design, 
always mark your each each revision of your design. Mark it visually. The idea is that when you send your board off to the board house, they'll flip you back an image saying, "This is what we're going to make. Is it cool?" And you say, "Let me check the market." Because you send so many versions of your Gerber's back and forth between your PCB shop and you, you inevitably the the PCB shop in inevitably makes the wrong board, and you spend another month fiddling with it and then realize that it was the wrong board. Uh, your version was like two versions up that they helped point out a few flaws. You change it. Always put, just mark your boards. Down, every single time you hit save and email it off to the board shop, make sure that the board number is wrapped up. Probably seems smart. We could have, could have helped us. Um, check your DNPs. If you like, our, if you design boards and you'd like to put a lot of extra spots on it for changing stuff and testing stuff, Make sure you check your do not place components when they come back from the PCBA shop because they may have put down a cap tying the two clocks that you worked so hard to split up together so that when your micro goes into sleep, your Bluetooth clock gets completely messed up and you have no idea why, why it doesn't work for about three weeks until <laughs> someone takes a microscope or a magnifying glass and looks at your board looks at the schematic and figures out that they placed an 0201 on a DMP. Um, proto runs, this was a tip someone had. Always enlarging the pads. Say you're putting down a QFN or something like that. Always enlarging the pads. Like, you know, on a, on a production board, you can have really tight pads on a QFN because you're doing, you're doing, you know, uh, you're baking them in an oven and it reflows. When you're doing it by hand, just make the pads go past the component and then you could practically hand solder anything except for meat So that's a cool little tip. Um, and this is the one that I wish I had learned. The marginal cost of changing your design or changing your PCB is so much, like it may seem like a lot, it may seem like $2,000 or something like that. It is so much less than fighting with a design that's not designed correctly. And I wish I had done that many, many times. And now I'm in the mindset that it's totally worth spending an extra 2,000 bucks to respin the board to eliminate a problem that's going to cause you two weeks worth of work at a minimum, and everyone knows that it's going to cause you like two months worth of work. Like, yeah, that's. How, how early did that happen? So it happened very early. I was still in university when the industrial designer joined onto our team. It was a very fortuitous situation since he was working for free and just enjoying himself, like having, having you know, doing, it's just like, I mean, imagine you're creating a circuit board. He just loved building product. And how did he integrate into the team? He was, he's never lived in the same city as us, um, working in lines, spitting out. Uh, I, I flew out to Vancouver to meet with him a couple times. Um, it's really good to be in person with your industrial designer when you're talking about uh, draft, when, he, when they've done, well, there's a couple different times. So when they've drafted up the first designs, uh, so that's paper designs, it's usually done with um, felt tip and markers. Um, really good to sit down physically with that person and think about where you're taking this product. Um, after that, we didn't really meet face to face until I showed the first prototype to him. Uh, he had an access to a 3D printer, which was huge. He would 3D print things and just FedEx them to me. That was really cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, so um, I think this was brought up at an earlier uh, solid state startups uh, with um, Chris Anderson, actually. Um, talking about CE and FCC. So there's some exclusions from FCC as long as you're a developer, uh, sorry, I don't remember the exact, old, exact legality of it, but uh, if you're not marking it as a consumer product, if it's not an end user product, then it's exempt. Um, it's tough, it's expensive. Can, can you say how expensive? Can you say, can I give it Yeah, it's like 8K, 8K at the low end. Was, was that was that what you did that thing? Yeah, for uh, for certification. I just wanted to add and that's more. something that you get when you get a Bluetooth module certification. True. Another hardware company that does Bluetooth stuff or Bluetooth. Yeah. 